Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for coming to this talk. So today we have Dr. Tong Zhao, and he is a senior fellow in the Nuclear Policy Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, based at the Carnegie Tsinghua Center for Global Policy in Beijing. So he will be talking primarily about China's nuclear weapons policies and approaches to arms control. Um, before launching into the talk, I just wanted to um, describe a bit the structure of this talk. So it's going to be 25 minutes of talking, followed by 25 minutes of questions. And if you have any questions, please do um, use the Q&A box at the very bottom. You can find it next to the participant section. And feel free to write at any point in the talk. At the end, I will then read out the questions from the Q&A. If you have any issues with admin, please use the chat box for that and we can help you there. So over to you, Tong. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's a great pleasure. Um, I was told to discuss China's nuclear weapons policy. Uh, it's thinking on nuclear arms control and opportunities for the West to engage China on arms control. So uh, I will start with um, China's nuclear weapons policy. Um, <clears throat> I think since the very beginning of China's nuclear program, uh, China wanted uh, to acquire a so-called basic means of reprisal. China felt that it needs a secure second strike capability to deter external nuclear uh, aggression. Um, so that's, that's the goal for China for, for the past few decades. And China had tried to strengthen uh, its credible nuclear deterrent uh, by increasing its survivability, et cetera. Uh, but today, I think uh, increasingly, uh, China is facing a more challenging uh, task uh, to maintain a credible nuclear deterrent uh, because uh, for a long time during the Cold War, uh, nuclear weapons were only threatened uh, by the enemy's nuclear weapons. Uh, but today, a wide range of non-nuclear military technologies uh, can pose a real threat uh, to nuclear weapons. Uh, for example, missile defense, uh, which is China's top concern today. Uh, China worries that um, if its primary nuclear enemy, the United States, launches a comprehensive uh, nuclear disarming first strike against China. Uh, in that scenario, maybe only a small number of Chinese nuclear weapons would survive. Um, and those small number of Chinese uh, uh, survived Chinese nuclear weapons will then face the threat of American homeland missile defense. Uh, so China worries that uh, due to that, uh, uh, you know, a very small uh, survivable nuclear, a small number of survivable nuclear weapons, even a limited American homeland missile defense system uh, could effectively uh, neutralize uh, China's second strike capability. Uh, so that was a major driver of Chinese nuclear buildup. Uh, and also today we have conventional precision strike weapons. Um, uh, those can be used to uh, accurately uh, target uh, nuclear uh, weapon platforms, uh, such as uh, nuclear uh, missile launch vehicles um, or the uh, entrance of the tunnels uh, in which China uh, deploys its nuclear weapons. Um, so uh, China now has to worry about uh, conventional precision threat uh, to its nuclear forces. And today, uh, US, Russia, and all the other new, uh, major powers, including China, are working on building a more advanced type of conventional weapons, uh, and that is hypersonic missiles. Uh, so China has this growing concern that in the future, uh, conventional weapons, including hypersonic conventional missiles, could threaten its small nuclear arsenal. And there are unmanned military uh, systems like uh, unmanned, area, uh, unmanned uh, aerial vehicles or unmanned underwater vessels. Those can be used to detect and track uh, Chinese uh, missile launch vehicles or Chinese strategic nuclear submarines underwater 
uh, further threatening uh, the survivability of Chinese nuclear forces. And even cyber technologies uh, in theory uh, can be used to penetrate uh, China's nuclear command and control system and disable uh, China and prevent China from launching uh, its nuclear retaliation uh, during a crisis. Uh, so China has to worry about all these uh, non-nuclear threat to its nuclear arsenal, which uh, makes China feels it is really hard uh, to, uh, to uh, maintain a credible deterrent. Um, and uh, I think uh, that concern uh, is really uh, fueling uh, Chinese uh, modernization effort. Um, so uh, in terms of capabilities, um, China is trying to build a nuclear triad. Uh, for a long time, China used to uh, rely mostly on its land-based uh, nuclear missiles uh, for deterrent. Uh, but increasingly, China has developed uh, more mobile uh, uh, land-based nuclear uh, la uh, launch vehicles and, and ballistic missiles, and the most advanced are the DF-31AG and DF-41 uh, Intercontinental Ballistic Missiles, or ICBMs. Uh, the DF-41 uh, was uh, paraded uh, last year, and it is the most advanced Chinese strategic nuclear weapons today. Uh, it can uh, range uh, the entire US continent uh, from uh, uh, if launched from the uh, inner uh, the inland of China and uh, it um, could uh, be armed with uh, more than uh, one warhead uh, on each missile. Uh, in terms of its sea-based nuclear deterrent, uh, China uh, is now operating its second uh, uh, generation uh, nuclear strategic submarine uh, or SSBMs. Uh, the 094 type SSBM, uh, which is armed with China's second generation submarine launched ballistic missile, uh, JL 2. Um, however, China's uh, nuclear strategic submarines are still uh, relatively noisy uh, compared with other major powers. So they uh, are not very survivable uh, if uh, they are dispatched into the, uh, into the uh, deep ocean. Uh, they can be easily detected and therefore threatened. So people believe that today uh, China is uh, using uh, the bastion strategy uh, to maintain a, a credible sea-based deterrent, which means uh, China has to deploy uh, a large number of general purpose naval uh, forces uh, in its coastal area. Uh, such as in the South China Sea or uh, part of the East China Sea uh, to create a safe haven uh, for its SSBNs. Um, so its SSBNs in peacetime will operate only in these bastions and uh, China's conventional naval forces and air forces will uh, help protect these SSBNs uh, in the bastions. And if there is a crisis, uh, China will try to then uh, send its SSBNs uh, to, the, to the deep ocean to increase their survivability. And also uh, China needs its SSBNs to sail further into the Western Pacific uh, in order to range the US homeland because the current uh, submarine launched ballistic missiles, the JL-2, uh, their range is still limited about 7,000 kilometers. It is not uh, long enough for China to uh, uh, for China to be able to threaten the U.S. homeland from its coastal area, and China is also developing uh, an air-based uh, the air leg of its nuclear triad. Um, its uh, H6N bomber uh, is believed to be able to carry uh, an air-launched nuclear-capable ballistic missile. Uh, so that would constitute uh, China's uh, air-based nuclear deterrent. And in the meantime, uh, China is working on building a long-range stealthy uh, strategic bomber, uh, which is widely believed to be nuclear capable. Uh, so China is investing huge resources into all three legs of its nuclear triad. 
uh, that makes uh, countries uh, like the United States very concerned about the future trajectory of Chinese nuclear buildup. Uh, the U.S. government believe that uh, within the next 10 years, China will at least double the overall size of its nuclear arsenal. And by the way, uh, over, since the end of the Cold War, uh, China has been the only uh, nuclear weapon state uh, under the uh, uh, non-proliferation treaty uh, to be growing uh, its nuclear arsenal. All the other four nuclear powers, the US, Russia, UK, and France have been uh, reducing their nuclear arsenals. So Chinese government used to say that China is the smallest nuclear power among the five legitimate nuclear weapon states. But I don't think Chinese government can say that today uh, because according to open source research, China has already surpassed uh, the UK and maybe also France, and it may have become the third largest uh, nuclear power uh, in, uh, you know, behind the United States and Russia. Um, and also, um, Chinese longstanding policy is uh, if China is uh, attacked by nuclear weapons, no matter how small the nuclear attack is, uh, China, or how limited the nuclear attack is, uh, China is going to launch a massive nuclear retaliation, basically uh, using all its nuclear weapons uh, in, in retaliation. But I think over time, as Chinese nuclear strategy matures, people start to realize that uh, it is not a very rational strategy. Uh, if China was only attacked by one or two uh, nuclear weapons in a limited uh, nuclear conflict, it would actually make sense for China to also respond in kind uh, by launching a limited nuclear retaliation while reserving the rest of its nuclear arsenal to deter a follow-on uh, larger scale nuclear attack. Um, so if you look at what China has been doing is China is building up not only its strategic nuclear forces, those you know, long range ICBMs or uh, SLBMs that uh, could threaten the homeland of, of the United States, but also theater range nuclear weapons. Uh, in recent uh, years, uh, China has been uh, working really hard uh, to uh, deploy a large number of BF-26 intermediate range uh, ballistic missiles uh, that are dual capable. Uh, they can be armed with uh, both conventional and nuclear warheads. And they can range, um, they can uh, uh, cover, uh, you know, uh, uh, Guam uh, and all other uh, regional uh, military targets. Um, so it's a very capable theater range nuclear system. And also China has a DF-21, uh, which has nuclear versions. Uh, they uh, have a range of more than 1,500 kilometers and, and is a, a, also a very capable a theater range nuclear force. Uh, so uh, as China builds up its theater range nuclear forces, uh, it increases the concern of uh, the US and other countries that China may be uh, departing uh, from its traditional nuclear policy of a minimum nuclear deterrent, but moving towards a so-called limited uh, nuclear deterrent strategy. Um, uh, so uh, that's, uh, that's a point of tension uh, between China and the United States. Um, also, as China is busy uh, modernizing its nuclear forces, um, it is not paying enough attention uh, to the broader security implications of its nuclear modernization. Um, for example, um, China is uh, operate is deploying its sea-based nuclear deterrent capability uh, uh, since a few years ago. Uh, even though, from the Chinese perspective, the objective uh, is very limited, it it is primarily aiming at uh, ensuring a credible second strike capability. But in order to uh, make China's sea-based nuclear weapons survivable and effective. Um, and because the submarines are not very quiet, so China has to deploy massive conventional forces uh, to protect the submarines. And China has to uh, shift its maritime uh, military uh, strategy from sea denial uh, to sea control, uh, 
which means uh, China has to basically be able to completely control uh, certain uh, areas near its coast and be able to completely dispel all foreign uh, naval and military presence from those areas in order to make them safe for Chinese nuclear submarines. But that military posture would appear very aggressive uh, to Chinese neighbors. Um, so even though China is motivated by a self-defensive objective, but in fact, uh, it would require China to, uh, to transition towards a more aggressive military posture, including at the conventional level because China needs these conventional forces uh, to protect its uh, nuclear deterrent. Uh, so it could raise the risk of conventional arms race uh, in the region. Um, and also as China is busy uh, modernizing nuclear forces, uh, it does not pay much attention to issues such as the entanglement between nuclear and conventional uh, military forces. The uh, entanglement between nuclear and conventional forces uh, exists for all nuclear weapon states, but it is particularly uh, so uh, in the case of China. Uh, there are a few uh, different forms of entanglement. Uh, one is a country might co-locate uh, its nuclear weapons with conventional weapons or uh, their nuclear weapons and conventional weapons may share key components of uh, command and control systems, or uh, the most extreme form of uh, entanglement is that um, a country could develop dual capable uh, weapons. In the case of China, it has uh, deployed the DF-26, which is dual capable ballistic missile, um, uh, the, uh, the missiles can uh, switch warheads uh, on the battlefield. Uh, so it can uh, launch a conventional uh, missile and then uh, quickly uh, be rearmed with a nuclear warhead and then uh, launch a nuclear uh, uh, and then launch a nuclear attack uh, using the same uh, using the same missile launcher. Um, so China believes that uh, this dual capable missile offers a lot of military flexibility. Uh, it maximizes the military value of, uh, of one uh, missile system. Uh, but uh, I don't think China is aware of how such dual capable missiles could increase risk of misunderstanding during crisis. Uh, for instance, uh, in a conventional war between US and China, uh, if China starts to mobilize uh, the dual capable DF-26 missiles, the US, after detecting uh, the mobilization of such missiles, might mistakenly believe that the, the Chinese are about to launch a, a nuclear attack. Um, so that could raise risks of misunderstanding on overreaction. And if such a missile is launched, uh, in a conventional war, and the US early warning system detects such a missile launch, it won't be able to tell the nature of this attack. Uh, is it a nuclear attack or is it a conventional attack? Um, so it also uh, would cause confusion uh, in the mind of US decision makers and US may overreact if it, mis if it mistakenly believe, uh, believe that uh, a nuclear attack is, under is underway, well, in fact, uh, China is simply launching a conventional uh, missile. Uh, so there are risk of misunderstanding, but that risk is not deeply uh, studied uh, by China because it is not in Chinese uh, military tradition to pay attention to issues of inadvertent escalation during crisis. Um, so that could uh, cause uh, escalation risks. Uh, and uh, looking at China's overall nuclear modernization program, I think in addition to external drivers, uh, such as American missile defense uh, and others, I think there are also domestic drivers uh, behind Chinese nuclear modernization. Uh, one uh, such domestic factor is the pursuit of national prestige. Uh, 
uh, Chinese top leaders in recent years has uh, have uh, repeatedly uh, uh, stated that uh, China's uh, rocket force, uh, which operates China's land-based uh, nuclear and conventional missiles, uh, is a key pillar of China's great power status. And there's also uh, rising uh, nationalism within China. There are people who believe that a bigger nuclear arsenal could translate into greater diplomatic leverage for China. Uh, in fact, uh, opinion leaders like the chief editor of Global Times, Mr. Hu Xijin, has uh, uh, repeatedly called for China to uh, massively build up its nuclear forces uh, because he believed that um, if China has a much larger nuclear arsenal, uh, China will be treated more equally and with greater respect uh, by other international players. Uh, and this uh, advocacy uh, for greater nuclear arsenal uh, has received popular domestic support from the Chinese general public, uh, despite the fact that uh, the general public have been suffering uh, very uh, uh, considerably uh, from the pandemic and the economic concession uh, resulting from it. So you can see uh, if, if the Chinese uh, nuclear decision making is up to the general public, uh, we might uh, see even faster uh, buildup of Chinese uh, nuclear weapons. Um, so there is wide public support, uh, which is concerning. Um, there is also, I think, growing uh, bureaucratic interest behind Chinese nuclear uh, buildup. As China now pursues nuclear triad, uh, all the main military services uh, has, uh, uh, has interests, um, has stakes uh, in the nuclear, in, in the nuclear uh, cake. Um, you know, the uh, rocket force, uh, the air force, the navy, um, they all uh, have a piece of pie in the cake and they all want to maximize their own uh, nuclear business. Um, so now there are more domestic uh, stakeholders who uh, want to uh, increase uh, China's investment into nuclear weapons. Uh, and I think this dynamic uh, could also fuel uh, Chinese nuclear buildup in the future. And by the way, in Chinese system, uh, there is no uh, sufficient domestic checks and balances against uh, these bureaucratic interests. Uh, there is no uh, uh, scrutiny from media uh, or civil society. So it's harder uh, to push back against the expanding interests of the, of the uh, military bureaucracy. Well, now I will spend some time discussing, I think I'm, I'm spending already a lot of time, but I will try to also cover um, arms, arms control uh, issues uh, related to China. Uh, the US in particular uh, really wants China to join arms control. Um, so I will offer a few thoughts on how to make that uh, more likely to happen. Uh, I think firstly, uh, China and other major nuclear weapons, especially the United States, need to reach a basic agreement on what's the purpose of pursuing arms control cooperation. So far, the message from Washington is not very pers persuasive uh, to Beijing because the American message is China, uh, you know, the US wants to use arms control to constrain uh, Chinese uh, new, uh, military development. Uh, and to help itself uh, win the uh, comprehensive uh, competition with China. And the US has offered no incentive uh, for China to, to conduct arms control cooperation and has said, uh, and has um, made no uh, offer of uh, possible concessions uh, to China. So uh, China feels that uh, uh, if China conducts arms control, it is only going to uh, benefit the United States and would put uh, unilateral constraint on itself. So I think the first step is for US, China, and other nuclear powers to clarify that they 
despite their growing uh, strategic competition, they all share a common interest in managing their competition, making sure their military competition would not develop into a dangerous and costly arms race uh, and uh, the risk of uh, nuclear escalation would be uh, would be uh, contained. Uh, so that's uh, step one. And then uh, we need to address the issue of uh, asymmetrical capabilities. Uh, China's nuclear arsenal is about uh, one order of magnitude smaller than the current operational nuclear uh, arsenal of the United States or Russia. Uh, so we have to come up with a more uh, innovative approach uh, to include China in arms control regimes. And one way to do so, I think, uh, is to um, uh, combine a strategic level uh, nuclear weapons and a theater level uh, military capabilities. Uh, because the United States and Russia have uh, superiority in strategic uh, 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 nuclear weapons, whereas China has uh, superiority in uh, theater range uh, strategic weapons, including uh, nuclear and conventional missiles. So if we combine these two types of weapons, or in other words, if we uh, integrate the New Star Treaty and the INF Treaty in some manner, uh, we, can, uh, we may be able uh, to uh, put all three major nuclear powers, US, Russia, and China, uh, in one nuclear, uh, in one arms control treaty on an equal footing. So China can be, can enter the uh, a future arms control treaty as an equal partner rather than a smaller partner uh, to the other uh, uh, nuclear powers. Uh, another thing is uh, given Chinese concern about uh, missile defense, uh, which again is the most important external driver of Chinese nuclear buildup, uh, it would be really uh, useful uh, to also uh, include uh, strategic defensive weapons into future uh, arms control agreements. Um, uh, in this re regard, um, I think uh, the American position is very firm, which is the US would never uh, limit uh, its missile defense capabilities uh, and would not allow other countries such as Russia and China to decide American missile defense policy uh, because the US feels it needs to address the growing uh, threats from North Korea, Iran, uh, for example. Uh, but I think uh, even uh, before asking the United States to make any hard limit on, its, uh, on the numbers or the capabilities of its missile defense, there is still uh, plenty of room uh, for a discussion and a cooperation to uh, understand and address Chinese concerns. Uh, one uh, first step option, I think, is for US and China to jointly conduct an expert level study uh, to, uh, uh, to evaluate the technical feasibility for the United States uh, to uh, build a strategic missile defense system that can effectively intercept North Korean ICBMs without seriously uh, uh, threatening Chinese ICBMs. I think that uh, joint study can happen uh, at open source level uh, without uh, disclosing classified data and uh, itself, the process of jointly studying this issue itself uh, could be a useful confidence building measure to narrow their uh, uh, technical disagreement and build some uh, and build better understandings about each other's intention. It's also important, uh, I think, to uh, integrate nuclear and outer space arms control efforts because for a long time China has made a connection uh, between nuclear arms control and outer space arms control. Um, uh, now China itself uh, has become a more powerful uh, power in outer space. It has acquired uh, similar capabilities as the US in outer space. So that uh, provides a new opportunity uh, for the two countries to engage in outer space arms control discussions as equal partners. 
Um, and I think for the near term, uh, you know, we have to acknowledge the fact that the distrust between China and the United States is huge. And distrust between China and uh, Western countries, I should say, in general, uh, is uh, very uh, significant. Uh, so, and, and also due to China's very strong skepticism towards the concept of arms control, it is impossible to uh, negotiate and conclude an ambitious arms control agreement uh, in the for, for the foreseeable future. Uh, so we have to uh, look at near-term uh, measures and uh, to for you know to promote cooperation. And one such near-term uh, measure uh, could be a risk reduction measures. Uh, so U.S., China, and other nuclear powers can work together to reduce the risk of nuclear use. I think that's. An a common interest uh, that uh, uh, is clearly shared by all nuclear powers and Chinese government itself has made clear uh, it, it wanted to discuss uh, nuclear risk reduction measures. Uh, so there are many uh, possible options for China to uh, conduct nuclear risk reduction discussions with other uh, countries, uh, including uh, to jointly clarify the nature of their uh, their missiles, whether they are armed with nuclear only or conventional only warheads, or if they are dual capable missiles. And especially uh, as, as all nuclear powers are developing hypersonic missiles today, it would be helpful for them to discuss the implications if future hypersonic missiles are conventionally armed or nuclear armed or uh, dual capable. Uh, I think given the uh, fast speed and the maneuverability of hypersonic missiles, making them dual capable would introduce additional uh, risk of misunderstanding and inadvertent escalation. So maybe these countries could dis discuss these security implications together. And if they can build common understanding on their risks, uh, they can take timely measure uh, uh, to avoid uh, developing or deploying certain types of hypersonic weapons. Um, in the long run, as I said, uh, there is a huge uh, skepticism within China about arms control. So we have to start a comprehensive program uh, to help China build capacity, uh, to help China appreciate uh, the value of arms control. Um, you can often hear uh, Chinese experts say that if China negotiates an arms control agreement today with the United States, um, because China is, uh, is inferior in terms of capability, uh, because China is a weaker party, the US uh, would be able to uh, cheat uh, and violate the treaty without being detected. Uh, so, in other words, uh, many Chinese experts don't trust uh, that verification measures can be useful to deter and detect uh, violations and non-compliance. So we, we have to gradually help Chinese experts understand how verification regimes work, especially in the case of US and Russia, how did those two countries manage to overcome, to overcome their distrust during the Cold War and were able to uh, gradually uh, build a system of robust verification uh, and, uh, and uh, develop a mutual confidence over time. Uh, and I think it's also useful to um, invite Chinese experts to uh, monitor and observe uh, arms control inspection activity of the United States and Russia. So uh, China can gradually understand uh, what uh, specific verification technologies would be used and how uh, concerns about uh, secrecy can be effectively addressed. Um, so those are long-term efforts, but uh, you know, we have to start those efforts today in order to uh, 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 you know, change uh, gradually, uh, change Chinese thinking uh, over time. Uh, for the near term, also I think, uh, given China has become highly uh, centralized, has has uh, has uh, the Chinese political system has become 
highly centralized. Uh, well, it has been highly centralized for decades, but in recent years, it has become even more so. Uh, so uh, in order to uh, promote domestic discussions in China about arms control options, uh, we have to uh, have the support and blessing from the top political leadership. Otherwise, uh, Chinese experts um, uh, and officials would have no incentive uh, to discuss arms control issues. Uh, so it would be useful, uh, I think, to have uh, heads of states level engagement. Uh, it would be useful to have a summit meeting uh, between Chinese and American uh, presidents or uh, among the presidents of the P5 countries so that uh, US and other nuclear powers can directly engage with Chinese president. And if uh, President Xi Jinping could, be, uh, could agree that um, arms control cooperation would be useful to pursue, uh, that would really help stimulate domestic discussion uh, and open the door uh, for uh, uh, active uh, Chinese uh, consideration of arms control cooperation. Uh, so I have gone for uh, too long, I think. I will stop here. Uh, I, you know, if this is a huge topic, I won't be able to address everything in my initial presentation, but we'll be happy to address any comments, feedback, and questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, I mean, Tong has really good um, analyses, which you can also find on the Carnegie website as well. Um, where he addresses this in much, much longer text. I understand there's a lot to go through. Um, so we have a couple of questions here. The first question is from Lyndon, and they ask that whether there are domestic political dynamics contributing to Chinese nuclear buildup. So for example, in the West, inter-service and inter-lab rivalries also contributed to arms racing technologies in the past. So they ask, do you see any similar dynamics within China? I think you're on mute. So do you yes. want me to respond now or collect uh, more questions? Um, whichever, I can, uh, I can um, combine the questions. They're a bit long. So maybe just to answer one by one. Okay, um, um, thanks, uh, Linden. I, I think I mentioned briefly that I think there are important domestic drivers uh, behind Chinese nuclear modernization. Um, especially as China now uh, openly pursues nuclear triad capability. Uh, more uh, military services are involved in the nuclear business. They all have an internal interest to maximize their, their uh, you know, to, to get more resources for their nuclear business. Um, so I think as more stakeholders are asking for investment into nuclear uh, weapons and uh, supporting systems, uh, that would be uh, very, uh, that would provide a very strong, uh, very strong driver for Chinese nuclear buildup. Um, and, and there is, again, there is no check and balances to, to uh, push back against the domestic interest groups. Uh, there is no civil society, there is no media uh, uh, scrutiny. Uh, and uh, in China, uh, the general public uh, have this view that the defense industry uh, uh, you know, represents Chinese national interests. Uh, so everything they do is in the key interest of China should, and, and therefore should receive support uh, from every uh, Chinese. Uh, so rather than seeing defense industry as you know, stealing uh, taxpayer money for their uh, own benefits, the Chinese population uh, wholeheartedly support uh, you know, the defense industry. So there is no, no internal checks and balances. Um, so I worry that uh, uh, these uh, internal bureaucratic uh, interests, um, and of course there is internal uh, competition among themselves, but I think still given the lack of uh, external uh, checks and balances uh, is, is uh, it's hard to prevent them from uh, further driving uh, Chinese nuclear buildup. Okay, thank you for the answer. The next question is from Jenny. Um, they ask, what is the role of the Chinese People's Association for Peace and Disarmament 
Is it against a nuclear buildup in China? And if so, does it have any influence on the bureaucracy? Well, that's a sensitive question. Uh, I think that a specific organization uh, had involved uh, in a lot of uh, international exchanges and dialogues uh, related to nuclear issues, including nuclear disarmament. Uh, but um, I don't think uh, they are a strong promoter of nuclear disarmament. And their view, you know, they are closely associated with the government and therefore uh, they, you know, they have to uh, they have to repeat the government position. Um, and um, so in that regard, uh, you know, they are the same as other uh, Chinese uh, institutes. Uh, they don't have a more uh, proactive view on the issue of arms control or disarmament. And in recent years, I think this organization has done less and less work on arms control and disarmament issues. Uh, its focus has shifted to other areas. Um, so that's, uh, that's it, I think. Okay, um, next question is from Lyndon. So they wanted to ask about um, whether you can envisage China or how, you, how do you envisage China pitching the idea of um, rejoint US Chinese BMD development to counter um, DPRK missiles. So how would China sort of pitch this idea to DPRK? Um, well, I think, um, I don't think China is in a position to say, you know, we should help DPRK uh, maintain a credible nuclear deterrent uh, because Chinese position is North Korea needs to denuclearize. And um, so I don't think it. Sh I don't think it. It should be a diplomatic problem for China. Um, you know, China can easily say that North Korea has already agreed uh, at a Singapore summit uh, to uh, move towards achieving the eventual goal of a nuclear-free uh, Korean Peninsula. So why should North Korea worry about uh, U.S. missile defense? Um, if North Korea is going to uh, give up its nuclear weapons uh, sooner or later. Um, so I think China also has to recognize that as long as uh, uh, North Korean ICBM capabilities, uh, nuclear capable ICBM capabilities exist, the uh, US would have a legitimate interest to uh, improve its uh, homeland missile defense. So given all these factors, I think the best we can do is to have a a joint technical study to, to see whether it is feasible uh, first uh, for the US to, to make sure its, its homeland missile defense is only capable against North Korea, uh, but not China. Uh, I think today there is, uh, you know, this is a critical question uh, and we need to have a clearer answer before US and China can have a meaningful and uh, candid discussion on, on the issue of missile defense. Uh, so the next question is from Jamie, and they ask, to your point about China not paying enough attention to the broader security implications of its modernization program, what role does slash can civil society play in helping the government think about these issues, for example, on entanglement? Um, maybe I should, I should, uh, I'm not sure I fully get the question. Uh, I, I heard the entanglement part but what's the part about uh, China's concern about border security? Um, broader, broader security implications. Oh, broader, oh, broader. Yes, yeah. of the modernization so, program. Um, so yeah, to your point about China not paying enough attention to the broader security implications mm -hmm. of its modernization program, um, what kind of role do you think civil society can play in helping the government think about these issues. So I'm not sure if the civil society, I think, pertains to maybe the Chinese civil society. So I think it might be that. Okay. Um, well, I, I think um, at least, um, firstly, um, civil society who, who has the expertise uh, can 
can can contribute to policy uh, discussions, uh, public policy discussions. Um, I was able to uh, help uh, my current colleague uh, James Acton uh, a couple of years ago to work on a report on the issue of entanglement. So I think that was the first uh, systematic uh, academic research on the issue of entanglement and their escalation risks. And together with a Chinese colleague, Professor Li Bing, uh, we also drafted a paper uh, to look at the implications for China uh, to examine the potential escalation risks from Chinese entanglement systems and other issues. So after these studies are published, uh, it uh, appears that the Chinese government and government affiliated experts uh, were paying close attention. Uh, so they uh, translated the report into Chinese. Uh, they widely spread the report uh, within the Chinese uh, security uh, community. So over time, I start to see Chinese nuclear experts uh, write uh, papers and articles that discuss this risk of entanglement. I think that's a good sign. Uh, so I think uh, even so, you know, independent experts, civil society experts, can you know, as long as uh, you know, we provide mutual independent uh, analysis, um, as long as our arguments uh, make sense, I think they will be absorbed uh, by Chinese government or government affiliated experts, and they will gradually uh, have an impact. Um, so it, you know, this process of uh, building capacity, uh, increasing awareness will take time. It cannot be uh, changed, you know, the situation cannot be changed over time. Um, thank you for the response. So the next question is from Tara or Taras. Um, so the question is, to what extent do you believe it is technically feasible to develop a missile defense system capable of intercepting North Korean missiles without China feeling that its nuclear deterrent is under threat? Well, without conducting that analysis, I don't know. But I think even if the uh, funding, uh, the, the funding of this joint study is, it is impossible uh, to come up with American uh, strategic missile defense system that can only intercept North Korean ICBMs, but not Chinese ICBMs. It is okay because in this process of conducting this joint study, the Chinese experts would have an opportunity to know uh, there are real uh, technical reasons. Uh, there are real geographical reasons because, for example, North Korea locates too close to China. Um, and so there are objective reasons, or objective obstacles that make it impossible for the U.S. to, disting to, to, distinguish, uh, its, uh, to distinguish between uh, uh, North Korea and the Chinese ICBMs. Uh, so understanding that there are real challenges would help because it would uh, uh, remove the Chinese suspicion that the U.S. Uh, you know, has a political intention to deliberately threaten China. So understanding the objective obstacles in itself, I think, can help build confidence and reduce misunderstanding. Thank you. So next question is from Martin. Um, which I just saw now. Uh, you mentioned popular support for nuclear weapons development. Is this a significant factor to the, I guess, nuclear arsenal expansion? Uh, no, I'm simply raising concern about the rising nationalism uh, in China. And uh, this is, has uh, displayed also in the uh, domestic debate on uh, nuclear issues. But uh, so far, uh, Chinese nuclear decision making is very secretive. Uh, it is being made by a small number of most senior uh, decision makers. Uh, it looks like the influence of the general public on Chinese nuclear thinking, official nuclear thinking and decision making is still, is still limited. But uh, my concern is uh, many decades ago, when China first day developed its nuclear weapons, its Chinese uh, nuclear scientists uh, who were really influential 
uh, in Chinese nuclear decision making because they understood nuclear weapons. They had close connections with Chinese top leaders in the process of developing nuclear weapons. So their views are highly valued by Chinese political leaders. And those Chinese nuclear scientists, the, the people who build and maintain uh, Chinese nuclear weapons, uh, they happen to, uh, to be, uh, uh, to be uh, interested in arms control uh, concepts because uh, as uh, you know, since Chinese reform and opening up uh, in, in the early 1980s, those nuclear weapon scientists, uh, they, they received a lot of invitations from uh, international colleagues, uh, from American scientists, from Russian scientists, etc. Uh, so they uh, had a lot of opportunities to uh, to participate in international scientific exchanges. And uh, their American and foreign counterparts were able uh, to, uh, to expose them uh, to uh, arms control uh, theories, concepts, practices. So uh, Chinese nuclear scientists uh, for a long time are supportive of cooperative security and arms control measures, much more so uh, than their colleagues in the military uh, and other uh, and other uh, sectors, uh, uh, but uh, over time, uh, I think their influence is declining. Um, today, we have a very strong leader uh, in Beijing, whose personal view uh, has the most important influence on every issue. Uh, so. It's, uh, it's increasingly uncertain uh, whether Chinese nuclear decision making will be up to professionals such as, as, such as a nuclear scientists, or it will be increasingly uh, shaped by the top leadership, the top political leadership. And if it is increasingly shaped by the top political leadership, then the uh, strong public voices, uh, including uh, views expressed by Hu Xijin, uh, the chief director of the Global Times, they might somehow uh, influence him uh, uh, because those uh, discussions are made in public. Uh, so I worry about this personal influence and, uh, and how it could affect Chinese uh, decision make, nuclear decision making in the future. Very interesting response. Um, we have last question from Oliver. And he asks about Chinese nuclear submarines. So it seems like he wants to ask as to whether um, they're noisy, first of all, so whether they can be detected. Um, and if they can be detected or they are noisy, um, why is there a difference between the Chinese nuclear submarines and US, Russia, and UK? And the second question to that connected is, um, could these countries perhaps cooperate with China on making their submarines quieter? Uh, well, Chinese nuclear submarines are believed to be more uh, uh, to be noisier uh, because China has had less experience developing and uh, operating uh, nuclear submarines. Uh, its SS beam program. Uh, became operational uh, much later uh, than US and uh, Soviet, Russia, UK and France. Uh, so, it, uh, so it would take time before China uh, develops a, a highly uh, quiet and survivable SSBM fleet. Uh, whether other nuclear powers should help China uh, enhance its uh, SSBN capability and make them more survivable. In theory, uh, that can contribute to China's greater confidence in its nuclear deterrent and would make China less paranoid about a nuclear threat. Uh, so that would be helpful in theory, but I think in practice, um, it's highly unimaginable that uh, nuclear powers would share their most uh, secretive uh, nuclear technologies with their rivals. And also, I, fundamentally, I think 
Okay, this is not just about China. This is, I think, uh, more broadly, a country's paranoia. I think it's mostly a result of internal issues. Um, so external assistance may be able to address part of a country's concern on a specific issue, but if a country is paranoid for internal reasons, it will be able to find new things to worry about. So providing could you possibly, access, could you possibly expand on um, the um, paranoia coming from, um, is it more like domestic politics? Well, I will use North Korea as an example to, uh, make uh, to avoid uh, sensitivity. Um, North Korea is a paranoid country, I think, mostly because uh, it is isolated from the rest of the international community. Um, North Korean people, all the way from the top leadership to their senior officials, to their uh, security experts, and all the way down to ordinary North Koreans, they have a fundamentally problematic understanding about the outside world. Uh, that's the source of their paranoia against the United States and, and others. Um, without addressing that, uh, it's hard for North Korea to, to really feel safe. You know, if, if, if the US, for example, is willing to completely withdraw its troops from the South Korean Peninsula and completely cut off its alliance relationship with South Korea, the most radical measures that US can do to help reassure uh, North Korea, North Korea would still worry that, okay, the threat is temporarily removed, but the US can always redeploy uh, its troops and strategic military assets to the peninsula whenever it changes its mind. So you can never reassure someone who is itself paranoid. Uh, so um, I think similar things can be said by, uh, you know, uh, about other countries. So actually following on from that, do you think there's only temporary solutions to this kind of thing? Because if it's an internal problem, then it's, I mean, it's very, very difficult to sort of assuage um, the kind of concerns there. And also, obviously, nation states have their own interests, America does in particular. So it's going to be, I mean, there's going to have to be something very, very radical and probably over many years for uh, North Korea to feel safer with regards to the US, for example. Yes, that's why I'm very uh, pessimistic about, um, you know, uh, the prospect of US, North Korea, uh, transforming their relationship and about the prospect of North Korea uh, becoming less paranoid uh, in the foreseeable future. Uh, and uh, I'm also pessimistic about the uh, deepening uh, rivalry between China and the United States. Uh, I don't think uh, the threat perception can be changed anytime soon. Uh, it, things will get worse and it will take a long time before it can get better because you need time to gradually change the mindset and deeply uh, held perceptions. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I'm going to ask one last question to wrap it up. Um, I'm quite curious about Japan's impact on China, um, especially concerning like US-China stability, if Japan plays any kind of factor there. Yeah, um, you know, Japan and uh, other uh, American regional allies in Asia Pacific uh, play a very important role uh, in the US-China strategic uh, relationship. Uh, you know, China, China's one of China's longstanding complaints about United States is the US is not willing to adopt no first use policy uh, or to explicitly uh, commit to a strategic stability relationship with China. Uh, but from the American perspective, one important reason the US couldn't adopt no first use is because of the concerns of American allies. Uh, Japan, for example, worries that if there is a very stable nuclear relationship between US and China, uh, China would be emboldened 
to take a more aggressive military uh, uh, posture at the conventional level, and Japan will therefore be threatened. Um, so I think uh, in order to uh, persuade the United States uh, to adopt policies that China wants to see in their nuclear relationship, uh, we have to recognize there is a connection at the conventional level and with American regional allies. And one way I think to address this dilemma is for China to offer some security assurance uh, to American regional allies. Uh, one way China can do so is to uh, make a political uh, commitment of not using military means to resolve territorial disputes with neighboring countries. I think that can go a long way to reassure countries like Japan. And uh, with that, uh, I think US would be more likely to discuss no first use and other bilateral nuclear uh, strategic stability issues with China. Okay, so I'm going to wrap it up here. Thank you so much. It's a very interesting um, talk that you delivered. Um, I know there was also quite a lot of you, quite a lot to say as well that I did ask of you. So thank you for delivering it very concisely. Um, and thank you everyone for coming and asking those questions. Um, as again, as I said, if you want to look um, more at his work, look on um, the Carnegie website, if you look up Dr. Tong Zhao, and you'll be able to find his work. So yes, thank you, and I look forward to your future work as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Looking forward to keeping in touch. Thank you. Bye.